tell us a little bit more about your role before we sort of dive into conversation, because you have a unique role here at Good Friends. Um, so I am uh, one of the Group M implementation leads, and what was started as television years ago is now quickly evolving into sort of video and more um, agnostic video, so not just television video, but place-based, digital, online, et cetera. Um, and that's sort of where we're going, because as we look at sort of the landscape and as we've seen technology change, it's really about where people are consuming the content, not the platform they're consuming content on. So that's interesting. So you're, I mean, you're, you were reared in the television buying mm -hmm. industry, Correct. right? And now you're, now you are afforded this arsenal of tools and data and theoretically actionable sort of weapons with which to make more mm -hmm. informed buying and do perform better for it, your clients. Is that the reality of it? Or well, I mean, I think it, you know, I think what is expediting that is the technology advances are making it more seamless. But we've all used different data over the years to really, you know, hone our choices from a programming standpoint. And that, you know, if you look at it at sort of the granular level, and I'm not going to, you know, say that this is the be all end all, but things like MRI and Simmons and Nielsen tab data, all of that is sort of the fundamental building blocks of the new sort of data that we're using to make decisions now. So, you know, they're the earlier use of things like Axiom or Experian data or, you know, profiles in terms of we've always used that to make selections from a content standpoint. And now we're just it's more automated. But if we if we look at the industry as sort of, you know, money equaling power. I think that's a pretty nice equalizer. <laughs> you know, TV's still the big dog, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and that being said, uh, if we look at it from an economics perspective of supply and demand, if the TV guys still don't want to sell their inventory in, on, through programmatic platforms, where does that leave us as an industry? Are I mean, we going to scream it, loud enough to I, get them to start doing it? I think at some point in time, you know, it's going to change. Part of the reason that TV is sort of the largest is from a content standpoint. So, you know, nobody has tried to put the Super Bowl online yet in terms of full streaming and that being the only platform for it. So, you know, the thing that really drives it is the ability to then create mass reach very quickly, which is very hard to do from an online video display standpoint at this point. Um, but that will change. And then there's also the aspect of perishable inventory. So when you look at it and say, you know, from a competitive standpoint, an episode of Family Guy has three commercial breaks in it. There are five or six fast food restaurants that are competing for those three, three breaks. Where you have scarcity of inventory, that's going to drive price and prevent sellers from wanting to go from a programmatic standpoint. Um, but the reality is we already buy programmatically. We buy audiences because not 100% of any client's budget can be based on contextually relevant uh, placements. But is it one of the inherent value propositions of programmatic, the sort of real-time nature of it? And the reality is the business cycle of television is that 70% of it is sold in the second quarter of the year. It, yes, but that's because of scarcity, not because of you know, the ability to do programmatic or not. So if you only have you know, 20 units in the finale of American Idol to sell, those are going to go very quickly because there are only 20 units to sell. If I need to reach those audience, that's one of the sort of group M propositions in terms of we can make decisions using our other tools to really push value equations. And look, we can find those people who are watching the finale of American Idol 15 different ways to Sunday and far more efficient. But it doesn't have that aspect of water coolerness, of the hipness, of the social conversation going around when it's happening in real time. And that's where fun some of the differences lie. So how has programmatic and specifically the illumination of what, you know, we well, let's blanket called TV everywhere inventory, which is just derivative tel premium, prime, premium television inventory delivered over IP. How has that being lit up on programmatic platforms changed the upfront conversations, especially it, when video is a make good currency? It really hasn't, not yet, because part of it is there's not huge scale there. And that, you know, from an audience standpoint, you look at something like Duck Dynasty, Duck Dynasty has a very small viewing from an online standpoint where it's less than 1% of the overall impressions. So that is interesting. The vendors like it because maybe it will increase the yield on that IP mm -hmm. delivered property. And again, but at this point in time, it's relatively small. That will change over time. But it, you know, at this point, it's relatively 
but not is, impactful. Is, I mean, with your lens on, you know, and your sort of legacy, is cross-platform buying real when you talk about, and if, if context and adjacency is for the purpose of, your, of the brand that you're representing, if you're investing on their behalf, if that's your focus, is cross-platform really important? Do you it, care? I do. Um, and we're investing in tools to understand what the contributions are mm -hmm. in terms of what am I getting from an audience standpoint for my online, what am I getting from a television standpoint to understand those contributions. The other thing that factors in is economics. And so when you look at quality placement from an online standpoint, premium content because of scarcity is at a significant premium in some cases. And so for me to take a premium, spend money on Food Network, and then have to pay 30% premiums to buy online inventory on Food Network doesn't make economic sense. And so as a result, there's less of an incentive for us to shift money to there. Not that we're not trying to, but my goal is to drive value for our clients and telling clients to pay a 30% premium to add incremental audience of 1% doesn't make good economic sense. Right. I'm going to thank you very much, mm -hmm. Gibbs. I'm going to turn it over to some of your colleagues and, and the panel. Um, James, what's, what's your take on the, sort of the ever-increasing audience around, you know, the same, the same quality content mm -hmm. of C3 television mm -hmm. now available on IP? So, and forget in an IP construct the, the C construct at all, right? So it doesn't matter when, where. It's the same caliber of content. Do you see that as a disruption or just creation of more liquidity in a market? Like, what does it really mean from a planning perspective? Our biggest challenge is, is accessing that content. It's, it's the demand, the supply and demand factors that all center around that content and, and where we actually want to place those ads. The situation or the misnomer when it comes to video specifically on the internet is that there's just tons of content floating around out that you can just go and easily go and buy for like really cheap prices, it's just not the case. There's tons of content. You don't necessarily want to go and buy it, half of that, or the majority of that You don't stuff. like kittens, James? I mean, I'm not a big really? fan. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm getting a sort of an insight to your soul, and I don't know how I feel about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not a huge fan, but um, I mean, if you... Um, <laughs> I don't like kittens, either. Take, take a look at the best uh, uh, com comedy, right, which is um, one of the... Uh, which is a genre of content that a lot of our clients like to be around, okay? It has, like, positive brand attribute, attribute effectiveness and stuff like that. A lot of that stuff is also completely unsuitable when it's online without any barriers for um, a, a big CPG brand, for example, or a family brand uh, like Kimberly Clark. So I think that um, there's, there's that misnomer to deal with, and I, I think what you're going to see is, is that, that that should change over time. Um, Premium publishers right now don't need to sell their content programmatically because they sell it out. You know, mm -hmm. if, if anything, they're trying to find ways to, you know, make it more cluttered just to get some more impressions against it. I remember when um, uh, FUPs first went online, you had one ad per pot. It was great. You know, you could own a whole, whole show for your, for your advertiser. And now you're competing in the same clutter that, that you are on, um, on TV. Um, but I think, I think that will start changing over time. And um, just recently, I mean, Zaxis have put their stake in the ground. They've released their, their premium product where they've said, OK, so we're going to go and do these deals as Group M, the biggest bear in the market, and we're going to go and build a supply of premium inventory. They've absorbed 24-7 with their 2,000 you know, publisher connections. They said, OK, we'll take that as well. And so they're going to start to become the supplier and the arbiter of a lot of that stuff and start opening up those access pipes. But I, I still wouldn't call that programmatic. 